we take the prayer first. Master of all worlds, highest power, highest power. merciful Merciful parent of compassion, compassion. in your presence, presence, eternal one, one. source of strength for us, us. as you have been for our our ancestors, we We very humbly acknowledge you. What are we? we? What What is our life that you have done such great great kindness to us? Therefore, Therefore, we we place our appeals before you, so that that you may give and and solve us of all our faults and failings. Our faults never become barriers between us and you. you. And may it be your desire to prepare our hearts to feel awe and love for you. May you listen to these words of ours. ours. May you open open our numbered hearts to the mysteries mysteries of your tone. May this hour of study be a source of pleasure, pleasure glory, and glory, and glory, like sweet incense. May like a shower down, down, down upon us the light of our souls, our souls and all the ways by, ways by which we define ourselves. May the spark of your holy servants, you have revealed, you have revealed these words to the world, shine and sparkle. May their merit, merit their ancestors' merit, Merit the merit of love, their, 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 their innocence, innocence, and their holiness. Stand, stand for, for us so as to prevent us from stumbling, stumbling when we study these words. In their their merit, eyes be may our eyes be illumined by what we study. study. Is in the saying, in the saying of the sweet king of Israel, my open my eyes and that I may gaze at the wonders of your Torah. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be acceptable to you, you, my rock and my redeemer. For it is the eternal, eternal who grants wisdom from his, his mouth, his knowledge, knowledge and understanding issue forth. Oh, no, 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 no,
All right. Good evening. We're going to begin on 422. <clears throat> and right, we didn't do this page, did we? I don't think so. Um, this is wrapping up the discussion of the encounter between Jacob and Lavan. When Lavan ran after Jacob, Jacob tried to escape his father in law. And uh, his uh, father-in-law, Lavan, catches up with him. And of course, he's very angry that his trafim have disappeared and he suspects that somebody has stolen them. Uh, but then when he searches, he doesn't find them anywhere. So <coughs> he gives up and he has, we already had it, that Lavan says, you know, I could really mess with you. Now, God told me to let you alone. But I really have the, 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 the ale, the power, which is another word for God, um, to do whatever I want against you, but I'm not, because I'm a nice guy. Um, so uh, they decide that, uh, well, and, and Jacob defends himself vigorously. And that's pretty much actually where we're up to right now, that uh, um, Jacob fights back and then they make peace. So 422. Um, and I don't know, do we look at, uh, is that a raising of the hand? Did I see that, Beryl? Yeah, all right. Well, I was trying to get unmuted at the same time because okay. it helps when you're the reader. Yeah. Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak <clears throat> said, all this rebuke that Jacob delivered to Laban brought him round to acknowledging the Blessed Holy One as is written. See? God is witness between me and you. Come and see what is written. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor judge between us. That wicked one reverted to his stumbling as soon as he said God of Abraham. He relapsed into saying God of Nahor. Okay, so this is um, when they finally decide to, you know, let uh, let you know let let uh, each person go their own way. So um, I'm trying to find the verse here. Um, so this is the um, verse 48, which leads up to this, is that Laban says this mound they they made a pile of rocks as a symbol of their covenant. Right, so Lavan uh, said, declared, this mound is a witness between you and me this day. That is why it is named Gal A, right? A, a witnessing mound. <clears throat> and it was called Mitzpah, because he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are out of sight of each other. So that's this idea that where it says, may the God of Abraham and the God of Noah, uh, back before that, God is witness between you and me, right? So then where are we? If you will treat my daughters or take other wives besides my daughters, though no one else be about, remember God himself will be witness between you and me. So we have this, this uh, mountain, mound of stones that symbolizes the witnessing and God is being called upon by love on to uh, uh, ensure that his daughters and uh, grandchildren will be 
protected and that Jacob shouldn't mistreat them in any way. So Rabbi Yitzchak says, look, look at how pious Lavan sounds. He says the God of Abraham, right? Um, no, he just says God, right? He says Almighty God, right? Uh, so Almighty God is the, is the witness between you and me that we're going to uh, be fair to each other. So Rabbi Yitzchak says, look, it's, it seems that Jacob had a good influence on Lavan and Lavan has thrown away his trafim, his idols, that he was so upset with losing. And now he's embracing uh, the one God of all. So very nice. However, that uh, um, acceptance of God is very short-lived because in another couple of verses, right? He says, um, verse 55 is the verse that verse 53, verse 53, I can't see the numbers. Right, so the con the rest of the speech goes, and Lavan said to Jacob, "Here is this mound, and here the pillar which I have set up between you and me. This mound shall be a witness, and this pillar shall be witness that I am not to cross to you past this mound. You are not to cross to me past this mound and this pillar with hostile intent." Okay, so he's drawn a line in the sand, and he says, "Okay, it's going to be a cold peace. We're not going to mess with each other, but that's because we're not going to have anything more to do with each other." And then he says, may the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, their ancestral deities, judge between us. Right? In the Hebrew, Elokei Avraham, Elokei Nahor, Yishpitu Beinenu, Elokei Avihem, the, the, the almighty gods of their ancestors. Right? And then Jacob uh, responds. So we're going to get to Jacob's response in a second. What does he say? He says the next paragraph. Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, right? By Yishava Yaakov befachad aviv Yitzchak, right? Pachad is fear. But what Rabbi Yitzchak says first is that look at what he's doing. Now he's mixing all the gods together, right? After he accepts God, and it sounds like Jacob has had uh, um, a good influence, then he ends up saying, no, no, there's your God and there's my God. There's uh, Nahor is his ancestor, Abraham is Jacob's ancestor. So um, he says, my God and your God in, will, will partner in making sure that this covenant is kept up. But Nahor's God is not the God of Abraham. Nahor's God is, an, is a pagan God, an idolatrous God. So Rabbi Yitzchak bemoans the fact that just when we thought that Lavan had uh, succeeded <coughs> in turning a new leaf, no, there he goes, he reverts right back again. Okay, next paragraph, Jacob. Jacob swore by the fear of his father, Isaac. Why by the fear of his father, Isaac, and not by the God of Abraham? Right, so remember, Lavan already mentioned the God of Abraham. So why now, instead of simply pointedly rejecting the duality, the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, why didn't Jacob just say, God of Abraham, period, to drive home this point of the exclusive uh, oneness of God? Why does he end up saying, no, I, I want to use a new name for God, the pacha, the fear uh, of my father, uh, Isaac? Why did he change it? Because he didn't want to trouble the right for the sake of Laban. Further, one should not swear, even in truth, by the highest realm of all. Okay. So there's a two suggestions. What was, what was uh, Yaakov uh, choosing to do? Instead of reverting to God of Abraham, it's instead, it's Pachat Yitzchak. And he says, Rabbi Yitzchak says, the first thing is the right side. Abraham is on the right side. Isaac is on the left side, right? Avraham is chesed, and Yitzchak is gvura or pachat, right? Pachat is the, is the uh, you know, connected uh, um, term. Might, that's untrammeled, is terrifying. So the terror of Isaac. So why isn't he mentioning the love 
of Abraham. Abraham's God is the God of love. And the answer is, it's a waste on love. To, to mention that in this context would be just worthless. Or we could go even further. Let's look at note 830. Okay. He didn't want to trouble the right for the sake of Laban. Jacob didn't want to call upon the divine right arm, Hesed, symbolized by Abraham. Apparently, because Laban was too wicked to deserve the abounding love of that sphera. Rather, he invoked Gevura, also known as Pahad. Pahad? Pahad. Here, symbolized by his father, Isaac. Right. So the idea is why waste this love? This love is not something that's uh, appropriate for this uh, reprobate Laban. How do you feel about that? Craig is giving a kind of a shrug, not an enthusiastic. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, you'd think that, uh, you know, maybe Jacob, can, uh, you know, might be a little more magnanimous and say, okay, you know, he's a, he's a no good Nick, but, you know, I'll be, I'll be the better person. I'll, yeah. give, I'll give him my love, even if he doesn't give it to me. And instead he's saying, eh, it's not worth it. Right. A little Christian charity here. Come on. You know, a little love. You know, what hurt, what would hurt to have a little love here? Um, but the Zohar, you know, doesn't doesn't suggest that that's what it is. And the, the Zohar is understanding love, you know, Jacob doesn't doesn't make a whole speech like that. He mentions Pacha. So um, so we can kid about it, like I said, but there's something going on here. Yeah. Uh, Jen. Um, I, I was wondering if, is this because Jacob, regardless of uh, not sharing Levon's family deity, he does want to make this stick, like this whole deal that Levon is saying, and that's why he's not going for the love side, but for the stricter side. It's like, yeah, this is a deal that I'm satisfied with too. Right. So by all means. So that's yeah. like, it, you know, not really allowing for flexibility in the deal and not so much about, you know, whether who, how he feels about his father-in-law for real. And, and also the idea that we need to keep that boundary here. It's not just that love on maybe doesn't deserve it, but also this is the, the situation here is not a lovey-dovey situation. The terms of this uh, peace treaty are very, you know, cold-blooded, very calculated, and it has to do with borders. And that's the left side. Right? The right side doesn't know about borders. The right side says, love, yeah, and you know, let's shower love you know, everywhere. But love on needs to be contained. Love on needs to be scared back into his place. And love on needs to respect that line in the sand that he drew. Well, just a second ago, Lavan also said, oh, I'm embracing the God of Abraham. And then, and, and then he, you know, reneges. So that line in the sand, maybe he's going to renege. Remember, Lavan is a reneger. He promises Rebecca, uh, he promises Rachel to, uh, uh, to, to Yaakov, and then he reneges. And he says, well, you couldn't really expect me to give you my youngest daughter when my older daughter isn't married yet. Come on, you didn't really take me seriously when I said that, did you? So this is, you know, you have to know who you're doing. Another part of that might be that he, Jacob is worried about empowering Lavan with the right side, right? Um, Lavan is a no good Nick. So giving Lavan extra love can be tricky, can be risky, because that will possibly, um, you know, encourage Lavan to, uh, uh, you know, play the kind of games that 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 Lavan likes to play. So Yaakov restrains himself from doing it. That's that's one explanation of the Zohar. And of course, these problems we've had them before in terms of generalizing. 
how do we deal with with bad people? Mm -hmm. How much love can you share with the bad people? And how much do you have to be on your guard? And how much do you have to communicate that you're being watchful when you deal with uh, people that are up to no good? Uh, these are, you know, ongoing, chronic, unanswerable, you know, definitively speaking, uh, challenges that we have all the time. Rich, did you say you wanted something? Yeah, yeah so um, what comes to mind is how, um, maybe I'm making a very bad analogy, but um, it seems like Jonah got a very different, um, he was kind of rebuked for what I seem to see as a similar attitude with Jacob. Right, right, I th and you're right. And the answer, of course, is it depends on the situation. When, when God says to, to, to Yonah, go out specifically to, you know, to do this mission, and Yonah second guesses God because Yonah thinks he knows better than God. Um, and Yonah is trapped in his own very limited sense of what people can or can't do. Um, but you know, that's exactly part of the, of the story there. It's built into the story that God told Yona that there is a different possibility here. Um, Jacob doesn't have a, a, you know, a, any kind of divine message that says, hey, give Lavan another chance. Maybe Lavan will do tshuva. Maybe Lavan will, will repent. Um, it's, a, it's a very different situation, very different story. Absolutely. And that's why I say it's very hard to know when to apply one attitude and when to apply the other. Uh, David shared with us in the chat an, a cute little uh, uh, wordplay, right? Love on, right? So, you know, what's, what's the, you know, the, the role of love in dealing with love on? Okay. Good. So back to here. Now we have a second suggestion. What's the second suggestion of the Zohar? So going back to, to this, this, this discussion that we just had and this the concern with Lavan and marshalling you know, uh, a good scary term of God in order to keep Lavan at bay, that the focus is on Lavan. Now the second one is that the focus is on Jacob. When you wanna make a commitment, be careful how solidly you commit yourself to something. Because we're all human. Every Yom Kippur, we say Kol Nidre. Every Yom Kippur, we say, you know what? We make promises, promises, promises. And then how, how good are we in living up to our word? So one should never swear, even in truth, by the highest realm of all. Because we are not creatures of constant truth. There's a little bit of Lavan in every one of us. The dichotomy between Jacob and Lavan is not hard and fast. And of course, that's one of the things that we also have talked about many times, that when Jacob meets Lavan, he meets a kind of a you know, reflection of himself. Jacob knows what it means to sort of play with the truth, to play with uh, um, you know, how, how uh, straightforward a person should be. So the Zohar second suggestion is whenever you swear, be careful. Don't don't overdo it, and 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 bring in the highest level of of uh, God. As I swear by God's blah 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 blah. Be a little more um, cautious, a little more humble about that. Okay, so that's not about them. It's about you, about me. When I make that that oath, I have to recognize that I'm just a flawed human being, and and. Uh, not be so, you know, so arrogant in the way that I marshal God from my side. Okay, Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yossi said, surely for proper affirmation, Jacob swore this way, fittingly. Considering the matter closely, Jacob thought, look, he said, God of Abraham, leaving out my father. I will complete all. Immediately, Jacob swore by the fear of his father, Isaac. Let's go to the end. 
alternatively to be encompassed by judgment confronting Laban. So the second part of it is very much along the lines that we've already been talking about, that you need to have strength to fight the people who have no principles. So Jacob is, is marshalling um, the troops, Gvura, might, pachad, right? Shock and awe. Um, so, um, because Lavan doesn't understand anything else. So that's something that, again, we've, we've, we've uh, we had some of that before. But the, the first part of what Rabbi Yossi says is a completely different line of thought. What, what is Rabbi Yossi suggesting in that first paragraph of this? Yeah, Larry. Rabbi Yossi is suggesting essentially that he's balancing the right and the left by completing, since uh, Lavan had, had sp spoken of the God of Abraham, which is Hesed, so he said, well, let, let me balance it off with the, with the, uh, with the other side, with the uh, Pachat. Yitzchak, the Gevura, so I balance it there. And then the, the last explanation, the alternative um, is, no, it's really uh, drawing, using Gevura. In other words, you know, basically calling, calling the, you know, calling out the, the, the mafia against, uh, the, against the, your enemies. Right. It, get, those, get those tough Jews to fight against the Nazis. It occurs to me that there's four, four explanations all of which are plausible. They all plausible, four plausible explanations of this, and that that reflects um, the difficulty of knowing how to deal with the Sitra Akra. In other words, when we sometimes, it, like not sometimes, very often in life, we, we have to deal with something that's, you know, really terrible. It's not just, you know, like slightly bad, it's pretty bad, it's bad. And the question is how to deal with it. Is it like this? It's very unclear. Right. I mean, the, to make the obvious even more obvious, here we are. How do we respond appropriately to what's going on in Ukraine? And uh, you know, uh, what's what's the what's the best response? Uh, what's what's the response that we're capable of? Are we doing everything that we actually are capable of of doing? Um, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking from my, you know, from my perspective, just of, of listening to, you know, Ukraine is running out of, of weapons, running out of ammunition, and that's why the Russians are beginning to take, you know, take a, a advantage and, and, and begin to become successful. My God, you know, if only, you know, the, the Ukrainians were, were, you know, stopping them and, and, you know, holding them at bay and, and, and pushing them away. So what's, what's stopping them? That the rest of the world isn't giving them, the rest of the world, including the US of A, isn't giving them in, you know, in, in, in the speedily enough, the, the, the tools they need, the pachat, right? The mighty frightening power to, to, push, the, to push the aggressor away. And that's also part of the pachad, right? Pachad can cut many ways. We're afraid. We're afraid of, of fighting. Uh, we're afraid of getting sucked into a battle. We, you know, we've gotten sucked into too many battles that were that were futile and and wrong. You know, in this case, it's it's a lot. You know, to me, a lot less problematic. It's pretty clear what an evil situation uh, um, was created by by uh, Russia. But uh, there's a, there's a, sadly, there's a, there's a fear that's the other side of power. We don't want to use our power. And this goes for Israel as well. Israel could have been so much more helpful and they're afraid. Um, so it's a tragedy. I want to, I want to bring up one more aspect of what Rabbi Yossi is saying. We, we go into, and, and we should, when he says, I will complete all. So we have, you know, the three patriarchs, Abraham on the right, Yitzchak on the left, and Jacob is the perfect harmony, the synthesis between the two sides. He's the central pillar 
in the middle, right? So that's the completion. And we've had that kind of a statement in the Zohar many, many times that he's the, the perfection of the, of the whole process. He's the culmination. So that's the completion. <coughs> I will complete all. But despite, uh, that's all correct, but there's a, 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 a hint uh, to my mind, and it doesn't contradict any of, the, of what we just said. When, when he says, look, he said, God of Abraham, that's quoting Lavan, right? It's quoting Lavan, Lavan said that. Leaving out my father. When he says, leaving out my father, we don't have to go into theosophical uh, you know, diagrams of the right side, the left side, the harmony, the middle, and so on, which we can, and that's fine. But before we do that, we should just take it very simply. This is Ben Yechabed Av, a son who is concerned about kibbutz Avaim, about giving respect and, and honor to their parent. And Lavan is dissing Yitzchak. Right? Lavan is leaving out Yitzchak. So on a simple human level, we can understand Jacob as saying, wait a second. I can't let that go by. I need to bring my father into the picture here. And that's why Yaakov can be Tiferet. That's why Yaakov can be the harmonizer. That's why Yaakov can be the, the culminating personality because he doesn't forget about one or the other. And he has every right to forget about Yitzchak. Right? He could be very guilt-ridden about how he fooled his father. Right? He's, he's, you know, he has that very, very you know, tricky, literally, tricky uh, uh, past that he's always going to be burdened with. That's going to happen in the next Torah portion. Right, Only a couple of verses later, he's going to have to confront his brother you know, you know, from the past. So what does Yitzchak mean to him? Um, and how much does he want to make sure that he, you know, declares his loyalty to Yitzchak, declares his, his uh, connection, I am my father's son. So it's not just a, a, a bringing up of the, of the divine forces of right and left. On a human moral level, on a, on a family, you know, child and parent level, Yaakov has a challenge here, and he steps up to meet the challenge. I'm bringing my father in to witness this as well. He is my father. So I think that that's also part of this. Okay. Um, <coughs> let's go now to the next page. And when we go now on this, uh, to, this, to this next verse on 423, we're coming to the very, very ending of the Torah portion. And we should remark that our Torah portion by Yetze starts with Jacob having a vision of angels and ends with Jacob having a vision of angels, right? It starts with the famous Jacob's ladder vision. He's exhausted, he conks out on the road in the middle of nowhere. And there he has this dream and he and he's has angels. He, he you know he he comes to this place by Yivka Bamakom, and uh, and he, and he sees the angels um, going up and down the ladder. When we um, have the very end of this Torah reading, um, hold on a second. So it says as follows. This is the beginning of chapter 32 in Genesis. Early in the morning, Lavan kissed his sons and daughters and bade them goodbye. Okay? It means that the whole extended family. Then Lavan left on his journey homeward. So Lavan turns around and goes back where he came from. In, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew, it's to his place, Lin Como. Verse 2. Jacob went on his way, um, and angels of God encountered him. When he saw them, Jacob said, this is God's camp. 
So he named that place Machanayim. Machanayim literally means two camps. Okay, so um, this is, and that's the end of the Torah portion. So we have uh, this parallelism, right? Or these bookends of Jacob encountering angels at the beginning and at the end. And let's see how the Zohar uh, notices some, some features of this parallelism. Okay, Jacob went on his way. Jacob uh, went on his way and angels of God encountered him. Rabbi Abba opened, male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them Adam, human. Okay, so this is the creation story that uh, um, you know, this is God creating both Adam, human as both male and female. Okay. How intensely we should contemplate words of Torah. Woe to the close-minded, close-hearted, and shut-eyed. Look, Torah proclaims before them, come, eat of my bread, drink of my wine, I have mingled. Whoever is simple, turn in here. She says to those devoid of sense, but no one pays attention. Okay, so the Proverbs uh, has this image of Sophia, of wisdom, Chochmah, which the rabbis understood to be the Torah herself. And the Torah is beckoning people um, and saying, come on, come on in, you know, take a load of your feet, have a nice refreshing drink. You know, it's, it's nice in here. Um, she, the Torah is the mirror image of the, you know, the, uh, what can I say? The, the woman of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, low repute. The woman of low repute also invites you in. Says, hey, come on, Say, you know, come on, big boy. Come on in and, and uh, enjoy yourself. But the Torah also tries to do that. Um, unfortunately, one of the women seems to be more successful in, in uh, getting clients than the other. Um, but the Torah has so much to offer. So Rabbi Abba has one of these periodic places in the Zohar where there's just this celebration of the Torah. The Torah is so wonderful. How could we possibly not appreciate the Torah? Woe to those people who just don't get it, who they, they don't let the Torah in. I, you know, I've said this, uh, this line so many times because it's so profound. When the Kotzka Rebbe asked his students who were the pick of the pick, the creme de la creme, the smartest, most learned uh, Jews around. And he said, my students, where is God? And they laughed and they said, what a, what a dumb question. Everyone knows God is everywhere. So, you know, what kind of question is that to ask such, uh, such smart students? And the Kotzker said, no, that's not the right answer. Where is God? God is where you let God in. If you let God in, then God is there. If you don't let God in, God can't be there. So that's what the Zohar is saying here. Those who are closed-minded, closed-hearted, shut-eyed, you don't want to see, you don't want to let anything in, you don't want to let anything into your heart, you're not going to let the Torah in. The Torah says, come into me, and you don't want to let the Torah into you, and you don't want to go into the Torah. So let's see now, that's his introductory celebration of the Torah. Now, what, is, what are the riches that he finds in this? Go ahead. Come and see. This verse contains supernal mysteries within and without. Male and female, he created them, implying this nuance, implying that nuance, implying that sun and moon share a single bond. And it is written. For it is written. For it is written. Bara'am. Um, he created them. As is said, sun, moon, Ahmad, stood still in her lofty abode, implying that Adam and Eve were created as one in a single coupling. 
since they appeared in a single coupling, immediately he blessed them, since blessing abides only when male and female are found. Okay, so here we have <coughs> Rabbi Abba expounding and expanding on this concept of when human beings were created, the fully human human is a human who encompasses both male and female. To be a full human being is to be both male and female. And for the Zohar, of course, the male and the female have different kinds of qualities. The male is the more active uh, uh, side. The female is the passive, the recipient, but a necessary recipient without receiving and uh, accepting the energy of uh, the male, nothing grows, nothing gestates, nothing gets born. So you need that complementarity and you need the union. Each one separately is only half a human being. And each of us is only half a human being if we don't unite within us, both the male and the female. So the proofs they have, that this nuance, that nuance, this side, that side, the sun and the moon, the sun for the Zohar is a male symbol. It's always shining forth. It's always giving out energy. The moon is receiving the sun's light. The moon is beautiful precisely because it knows how to receive the sun uh, in, in, the most, in the most amazing way. So the sun and the moon are connected. And therefore, we have a proof text from Habakkuk, where it says, Shemesh Levana Amad. It should have said Amdu, stood plural. But the sun and the moon here are treated as one entity, and therefore the verb Amad, to stand still by them, is, is used in the singular. The sun and the moon are one unit. When there is unity, there is blessing when the, 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 the male and the female can get along with each other within one human being, within a uh, relationship, then blessing can happen. Then it's possible to, for there to be blessing. And that's what happens in the creation story. When God sees that they're one, the blessing happens. When we get recriminations and when we get mutual accusations in the, in the creation story, the next thing that happens is curses and expulsion. If Adam and Eve could have actually maintained their own sense of togetherness, maybe their response to God would have been on a totally different order. And maybe then their unification with each other could have been the preliminary for a reunification with God. But what we have in the, in the creation story is everybody's for themselves. Everybody separates out. Everybody's blaming the other one. Um, so, um, the idea of oneness has been shattered. Okay, what does this have to do with Jacob? Come and see. Come and see. When Jacob first set out on his journey to Haran, he was alone, unmarried. What is written? The Yifka. By Yifka. He entreated the place. Okay, so let's stop here for a second. So now what the Zohar is doing is putting those two, the, the bookends, the beginning of the, of the Parsha and the end of the Parsha, putting them next to each other, the way male and female should be put next to each other. And they start expanding. So Yaakov is not married yet. We had a whole point before that Yaakov could not fully be Yaakov until he experiences what it means to be united with a, with, a, with a partner. And the word that we have at the beginning of the Torah portion is which means he happened upon the place. He encountered the place. He bumped into a place, right? We have at the end of the Torah reading, it says in verse two, Yaakov halach ledarko, Angels of the Almighty bumped into him. So it's the same word. In the beginning of the Torah portion, it's Jacob bumping into something, bumping into the place where he has his vision with, of the angels. 
in the end of the Torah portion, the angels themselves bump into Jacob, happen upon, upon Jacob. So that's a parallelism that the Zohar is going to play with a little bit. The first thing that they do, of course, is they read the word, the word differently. Vayivga is read by them as, and this is standard rabbinic uh, teachings in the Midrash, it's one of the words for prayer, right? To entreat, to, you know, to, to get in front of, of the person that you're begging and hang on to them and, and you know, keep on encountering them and keep on even pushing them and touching them and holding on to their, to their uh, shoulders. So Vayifgaba Makom says the Zohar, when Jacob comes upon that place, what it really means is that Jacob is praying his heart out. He's begging God for help because of course he's on, 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 the, on the lamb. He's running for his life. So the Zohar reads this as not simply by accident he came upon a place, but he prayed to Hamakom, which is a word for God. Right, Hamakom Yenachem Etchem. We say when we try to console somebody, may the omnipresent one, the place, give you consolation. So Vayevgab Hamakom, he entreated the place. What was the answer? But he was answered only in a dream. Okay, so his experience of the angels happens at night after he falls asleep, and then the Torah says explicitly. He has a dream. Keep going. Now, he entreated the place. He was answered only in a dream. Now that he was married and accompanied by all those tribes, supernal camps of angels entreated him, as it were. Entreated him. In the beginning, the first part of the Torah portion, it says he entreated God. Now they are entreating him. Got it? Got it? Carol, what happened to you? Well, I didn't know if you wanted me to go on when you interrupted. Well, trying, trying to go with them. <laughs> right, I'm trying to, to give a little emphasis in the reading. I, I got that, but I never know what I'm supposed so to let's follow. Go on. As go on. it were, supplicating him, as is written, Bayifka. Bayifkeu vo. They entreated him, coming round to entreat him, because by virtue of Jacob and those tribes, they are watered by waters of the vast sea. Okay, so now what the Zohar says is, look at how, look at where Jacob has, has, has gotten to. Jacob has now attained his rank. He's attained his station as the human uh, exemplar of Tiferet. He is the walking Tiferet, the walking divine culminating core of divine energy, at which point the angels are in awe the angels come to him rather than him coming to the angels. They're overwhelmed by his divine quality. This is what he has finally attained. How did he attain it though? He attained it by building a family. He didn't attain it by studying Torah for years and years. He didn't attain it by fasting and, and praying for 40 days and 40 nights. He attained it by struggling with the mundane challenge of building a family. How does a family with all of its problems endure? Through sticking together. So the power of union, the power of union is not just the power of sexually uniting with uh, uh, your partner in order to create children, but it's also the union of staying together, staying together from day to day, from year to year. Jacob was able to uh, reach that level because of that uh, persistence and that dedication to be at one with his family. Go ahead. Further, at first in a dream, 
now with eyes wide open in daylight, as is written, when he saw them, Jacob said, this is a camp of God. Right. So look at, at the, again, look at the attainment, the spiritual attainment of Jacob. The first encounter is at night. It's in a dream. It's murky. It's uh, Jacob uh, pleading with God to be there for him because he's in so much trouble. By the time he's on his way back home, he is so spiritually focused and so spiritually, to use a word that uh, some people think is a dirty word, he's woke. He's, he's, he, he sees what there is to see. So he can see angels walking on the road in broad daylight. You and I would walk on the road and all we would see is the dust and the trees and, and the rocks and whatever it is. Um, he sees angels in broad daylight right in front of him without having to go through a whole spiritual ceremony or, or uh, uh, purifying himself or doing anything like that. He has reached that uh, situation. And just, I, I, I didn't you know, uh, comment that the, all of the spiritual uh, realms are watered from the vast sea of Jacob being united with his family, right? Because there are the 12 tribes that, that have been created. This is now the, uh, um, the, uh, um, you know, the pinnacle of attaining God's presence in the world. Once God's presence is attained in the world, then the upper realms are sustained by that. They're rejuvenated by that. And that's the other union. That's the union of above and below. So everything is coming together. Okay, so he sees them in broad daylight. How did... Back to you, Beryl. How did he recognize them? He saw they were the same ones he had seen in the dream. So he called them Mahanaim, double camps. Camps manifesting above, camps manifesting below. Okay, so the doubling now is, oh, these are the, haven't we met before? Right, this is his pickup line to the angels. And he says, you look familiar. And they are familiar because he saw those angels all the way at the beginning of his odyssey, right? And now he recognizes them. And he says, oh, so this is it. This is the double camp, the camp above, the camp below. Um, before we get to the last paragraph, and this is the end, as you can see, in the, if you have the printed uh, volume in front of you, this is the end of the Zohar's discussion of Ayetze and the end of volume two. So I want to delay the ending for a second or two. Um, but uh, when we have the song at the Red Sea, so we have um, a verse that says, Ze keli This is my God, and I will beautify him, or extol him, or different kinds of translations, right? Um, Herman Welk took the title of his book on Judaism from that. This is my God. Zekeli. So the Midrash has a beautiful explanation of that. And they, uh, the Midrash imagines that um, the Israelites are trudging along. They are completely overwhelmed with emotions of fear and exultation. And are they going to make it? Are they not going to make it? Is God there? What's happening? It's a chaos. And the way the Midrash imagines it is that the adults are shown by the children that this is God. This is God. The children point to their parents, say to their parents, this is God. You know how I recognize God, say the kids? Because when you had to abandon me in Egypt, because we were, you know, we were supposed to be killed, and Moses is one of who knows how many babies that were abandoned by their parents. How did we survive? We survived because there was this young person that would come every day and 
coddle us and hold us and bring us milk and food, right? Not, not everybody got a, a daughter, a Pharaoh's daughter to do this. So, and guess what? That young person, we never knew who that young person was. And now that's the young person, that's the same young person who's splitting the Red Sea. Zach Kaylee, this is my God. So the adults are taught by the children that this is the same God, the same God that, that can hold a crying baby, the same guy that God that can split, split the Red Sea, save people and drown the evil people. It's all the same God. Zach Kaylee, you need an innocence of a child to affirm something like that. So same thing over here, Jacob in his innocence. And remember, Jacob is an Ishtam. Jacob is a man of innocence. He recognizes these are the same angels. Okay, last paragraph. Why did they appear in treating him? Because Shina approached him. Oh my goodness, my copy is very strange. Craig, could you read that sentence, please? Because mine's like weird. Sure. Why did they appear in treating him? Because Shechina approached him to possess the house. She was awaiting Benjamin to possess the house fittingly along with Jacob, whereupon is written, Jacob will return and be calm and secure with no one frightening him. Okay. So they are entreating him the way that that image of Torah entreats every single one of us. Come in, come in, taste how good it can be to, to uh, uh, enjoy these delicacies. Shechina is entreating Jacob, come, be with me. I need you to be my partner. Benjamin needs to be born. The 12 tribes need to be completed. And we need to make God's presence in the world a reality. Please, come on, come on in. And this is Shechina inviting Jacob, and of course, where does she invite him? Right at the threshold of the land of Israel. Shechina, the land, are one, and he is now entering the house. He's entering to unite with Shechina. And that's the happy ending, so to speak, um, of, this, of this Torah portion and of this discussion by, by the Zohar. Yeah, Larry. Two things one, that I noticed. One thing is, is Rabbi, Rabbi Abba started with talking about uh, being not warning you not to be closed minded or shut eyed. And then here, uh, Yaakov comes now with eyes open, why eyes wide open in daylight. He first starts out at the nighttime and he can't see anything except in a dream, meaning confused. But now he has eyes wide open. So He's doing exactly what Rabbi Abba is, is saying. And then the other thing I thought was that Shina now appears just like the quote that Rabbi Abba talks about from Mishle about Lady Wisdom. You know, in other words, Lady Wisdom right. tells you to come Beckoning. in. Beckoning. Come in, come in. It's my house. And then Shina here says, uh, and then it says, Yako is returning to the, to the house. Right, and just excellent. And to follow up on what you're saying, we also now have a uniting of night and day. Oh. Our portion begins with the night. It ends with broad daylight. Right? Jacob encounters in the nighttime. Jacob encounters in the daytime. They're all brought together. Right? This is two camps that are one camp. Um, just to share another little word of Torah, since I'll never get around to doing it otherwise. Um, later on, um, when, uh, when Jacob, <coughs> um, is thinking <coughs> just a few verses later about what trouble he's in because he hears that his brother, uh, Esau, is coming to get him, Right, so he starts praying to God. So this is uh, in the same verse, uh, chapter 32, but a few verses later, verse 10, 
Vayomer Yaakov, Elokei Avi Avraham, Elokei Avi Yitzchak. So he mentions both that God is the God of his grandfather Abraham and the God of Isaac. Hashem, Omer Elai Shuv Le'artz Cholom Adat Ulam Ola Adat Chavei Tivam. You, Almighty God, Eternal One, who told me to come back home and I'll be good to you. Katonti Mikol Achasadim Mikol Haemet Asher Asita Et Avdecha. Right. I am unworthy of all the kindness that you have so steadfastly shown your servant. Because when I left and crossed this Jordan the first time when I was running away, all I had was my staff. With my staff alone, I crossed this Jordan. And now I've become two camps. So he says, I've become two camps. But why did he become two camps? He became two camps because he split up his camps because he's afraid that Asaph is going to massacre him. So he says, well, maybe one of the camps will survive if, uh, you know, if, if they can get away while Asaph is, is wiping out the other camp. So that's what he's saying to God. Look at how good you've been to me. When I crossed the Jordan, I only had one step. Now I'm afraid for my life and I'm afraid that half of my, my family is going to be destroyed. Is that praise of God? Is that, is that some kind of gratitude that he has? But if you understand, though, he says, now I've become two camps. He's referring to this vision. He's referring to this vision of the angels, where he says, this is two camps. These angels are machanayim. They're two camps. Now I feel connected between the upper and the lower camps. So I was all alone. I then had to plead for you. Please, please listen to me. Come to my aid. And you did. And now I'm connected. Now I am two camps. Now I am the earthly camp connected to the heavenly camp. So thank you. All right, we're going to um, conclude here. And I have a question. Um, on the one hand, this is a very fitting place to conclude. Um, and I want to first not neglect saying from my heart, However open you know it, it can be, um, we all struggle with uh, with opening, keeping our hearts open, heart, our, our hearts open. I want to say with my whole heart how much uh, I love that we have been able to be together. How much I love and and am amazed by your dedication to uh, to study this and to grapple with it um, and to be together. Um, it's been a total joy and blessing for me to be able to look forward, to prepare, to wonder, to worry, and then to engage. And, you know, sometimes things go a little slow or whatever, but every night that we have been together, I've discovered something. And it's because of you. So thank you so much. Um, you know, it's been, you know, brought up what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I can't answer that. Um, I don't know yet where I'm landing. I hope that I'll be able to find some way of continuing to teach uh, this and I will keep you informed. But that's all unknown. What is known is that you've all been wonderful and terrific and amazing and beautiful. And thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're, you're the so one that's been you. amazing. I mean, no, you're the one. That, no, <laughs> wait a second. This has been an incredible trip, uh, uh, you know, an amazing journey. If if we were sometimes a little too dense, uh, you know, we apologize. I, I apologize anyway. Uh, but this, but, but this was um, just, I, I can't say it's just amazing. Yeah, the Zohar is pretty good. Yeah, it's good. Rabbi, this but is you helped us to Carol. understand it um, a little bit. We we're, we're all working on it. Yes. I, I, yes, it was, it's been a privilege for me. I, I acknowledge it. Thank you. Merle, what? Yeah, I just I, I want to confirm something that I, I heard. Um, but you're going to continue. If I, you, I can't. What happened I, I to lost you. I lost you. So I'm just going to re repeat what I just said. I can't make any guarantees. I have no definite ways of, of, of talking about what will happen in the future. I don't know what will happen in the future. God will show me the place that I'm supposed to go to. Um, and uh, when that starts developing, I'll have hopefully the, uh, the ability to share 
what the new developments are with you. Right now, I don't know anything. So, um, so that's where we have to leave it. Okay. As you cross the uh, the Delaware instead right. of the Jordan. <laughs> right. Right. We'll be... had, the problem is I packed my stick. I don't know where I packed my stick. I can't find my stick now. It's like ridiculous. What I'm saying right. is, but you've got it the Macom. Macom. Right. You'll uh, meet the place and you'll figure it out. Hopefully, we'll hear good things. <laughs> Amen. 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 All right. Just well, keep everybody. us, keep us with you much. in your travels. Absolutely. Thank okay. You. I'm going to end it. Thank you.